introduce um, John Lawrence, who is um, heading up our panel on data retention, wonderfully enough. Now, speaking of um, long form things, this is a guy who took 17 years four institutions across two continents to get his bachelor's. A Bachelor of the Arts, <laughs> to get that right. Um, he's he's uh, not afraid of controversy. Um, Philip Ruddock once said that he misattributed, that he said the right to privacy is greater than the right to life. Um, but you can defend yourself on that. Um, Professionally, he's made up for all of that stuff <laughs> by getting a, um, a master's at the University of Melbourne, um, ha by having two decades of experience in software and internet services industries across um, Australia, the United Kingdom, Denmark, and the US. He's big on freedom of speech, privacy, copyright reform, and resisting unnecessary mass surveillance. He's currently employed as Electron Electronic Frontier Australia's executive officer. Give him a round of applause. John Lawrence. Minister said today, it's not what you're doing on the internet, it's the sites you're visiting. So will it be the sites that you, you're well, visiting? Well, it, it, it wouldn't extend to, for example, web surfing. So what, what people are viewing on the internet um, is not going to be caught. So it's not the sites you're visiting? Well, um, what people are viewing on the internet when they web surf is not going to be caught. What will be caught is the, um, is, is the is the um, web address they communicate to. Okay, so it's only, oh, sorry, the web address, if I go to an internet site, that will be recorded and available. The, the, the web address um, is, is part of the metadata. The website? The web, the, well, the web address. The, the electronic address of, of the website. Okay, but if I go to the Sky News website, the Australian website, um, uh, a more questionable website, that will be, is that what we're talking about here? Well, I, that, my, my, the what you're viewing on the internet is not what we're interested in, and that's not what we regard. But you'll be able to see whether I've been to that website or that website or that website. Well, what we'll be able, what the security agencies want to know to be retained is the is the the electronic address of the website. When a connection is made between uh, a one computer terminal and a web uh, address, that fact and the time of the, uh, of, of the connection and the duration of the connection is what we mean by metadata in that context. But that is telling you where I've been on the web. Uh, what about social media? Right, well, thank you, George. Um, I, I thought we'd just play that for, for a few reasons. Um, one, because it's actually really hilarious. Um, also, because it's actually a little terrifying that this is the guy that's in charge of this issue. Um, and it also gives us a nice sort of starting point to actually sort of start to drill down a little bit into exactly what it is that we're looking to collect under this regime. Um, but first I'd like to introduce um, the rest of the panellists. Um, to my right is uh, Mr Chris Berg. He's on the telly, so you probably <laughs> recognise him. Um, Chris is the Policy Director at the Institute of Public Affairs. Um, he's a regular columnist on ABC's The Drum and uh, appears on that TV show at the high profile time of 5.30 on a weekday, um, on a regular basis. And he's an award winning former editor of the IPA Review. His latest book is In Defence of Freedom of Speech from Ancient Greece to Andrew Bolt. Um, he uh, wrote a monograph, The Growth of Australia's Regulatory State, which was published in 2008. He's also the editor of 100 Great Books of Liberty. That's, that's one book, right? Not a hundred, yeah, okay. Uh, with John Roskam, published by Connor Court Publishing in 2010, and the National Curriculum, a critique in 2011. So um, please welcome Chris. Um, to Chris's right is David Lindsay. Um, David's uh, an expert in technology law at Monash University, um, with specialisations in cyber law, copyright law, communications law, including broadcasting and telecommunications law, and privacy law. So. Um, that's all kind of relevant. Uh, he's, the author of, he's the author of International Domain Name Law, which is um, a book that I'd be probably one of the few people in this room would be interested in reading. Um, a comprehensive study of international domain name dispute resolution. Um, he's published many articles in the areas of copyright law, communications law, privacy law, and media law. Um, he's a member of the Media and Communications Committee of the Law Council of Australia, and is a board member of our good friends at the Australian Privacy Foundation. He's the general editor of the Australian Intellectual Property Journal, Australia's foremost academic 
Intellectual Property Journal. Uh, his current research interests include the right to be forgotten, which we've obviously touched on already, search engine liability, um, and legal, di legal dilemmas arising from big data. So please give David a welcome. Um, and down on the end is, uh, is Leanne O'Donnell. Leanne is uh, IONET's regulatory manager um, based here in Melbourne. She reports to Steve Dolby, IONET's chief regulatory officer, and provides advice and training across the IONET group on a range of issues um, covering privacy, telecommunications law, copyright and consumer law. She also provides input on public policy issues and represents IONET in various communications alliance working groups and committees. Um, as some of you may be well aware, before moving to IONET in mid-2013, Leanne played a central role as a senior lawyer in the legal team representing IONET in its landmark copyright litigation, from trial and full court appeal right through to the um, unanimous win in the High Court, um, which is uh, no mean achievement. With over 10 years' experience as a lawyer, Leanne has high-level research and communication skills, including a stint as a judicial researcher and a year as an operations manager for an NGO in South Africa. She's an avid user of social media um, and was listed by Mark Pearson as an expert on social media and the law in his book, Blogging and Tweeting Without Getting Sued, which is probably worth a read. <laughs> <It's> a <good laughs> book. And she's definitely worth following on Twitter. Um, Leanne's blog features her popular roundup of news and views on law and technology, so please welcome Leanne. Um, so before we get stuck in, um, there are, I, I think there's some compulsory homework reading um, that I'd like to um, encourage you all to do. Firstly is David Seidler's Hacking the Grapevine piece, which um, I, I recommend you look at. Um, the next thing would be the government secret industry consultation paper, um, which I'm very happy to share with you. Um, it's, it's a pretty thin document and pretty vague. It's essentially really only about four pages, um, and I'm very happy to, to send that around to anyone. Um, and then Leanne's very excellent response to that document. Um, and we actually have some dead tree versions up on the uh, up on the desk if anyone would like one, but I'll certainly send around a link as well. This is a this is a must read, um, and we'll probably be referring to it through the conversation. So that's a little bit of homework for everyone. Um, but to get things um, to sort of kick things off. Um, what I thought we might do is, is drill in sort of um, partly to sort of follow on from Mr. Brandis' attempt to define um, what the data is we're talking about here. I'm going to try very hard not to use the word metadata again because he's kind of ruined it for everyone. Um, but perhaps Leanne, do you want to give us, uh, do you want to get started sort of talking about what sort of what the current situation is in terms of data, data that's available and what, what is actually in this um, somewhat vague document mm. that sort of presumably is going to frame the legislation that we're expecting to see in two weeks. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think it was the 5th of August that the government made an, an in-principle decision to introduce mandatory data retention laws for two years. And then they had to go through the process of working out what that actually means, <laughs> um, which seems to be an unusual way to make laws. Um, so what they did that I'm aware of is produced two industry consultation papers, um, one that was published in the Fairfax papers and then broadly at the end of August. And then we sat around for a month and we got another paper um, at the, I think it was the 23rd of September, which is the one that John is pointing to. Um, it's quite similar to the first um, industry consultation paper that some of you might have seen. Um, I expect that the final definition of communications data for the purpose of the mandatory data retention regime will be actually quite similar to what's set out in the consultation paper. The Attorney General's department have been quite clear that they want a technology neutral regime so they don't have to keep changing it as soon as a new um, form of technology comes about. Um, they're also proposing an exemption regime. So if we argued, for example, that IPTV, um, which a number of telcos provide, well, what you watch on TV using the internet, we would argue is not particularly relevant to law enforcement. So should that be excluded from the mandatory data retention set? The Attorney General's department wasn't willing to exclude it, but they're saying you could apply for an exemption. 
And so we have a proposed data set that is quite broad, and what I tried to do in this paper was actually list out what we thought it meant. And it starts off with customer information, which is what most um, telcos would already retain already because we need it for billing and to provide customer service. And that includes things like, obviously, the customer's name, um, who else might be a billing contact if you've got a technical issue, your address, whether that's a business address, a residential address, a billing address. Um, and then it gets more technical into things like your email address, your phone numbers, um, bundled service accounts, your date of birth, your financial charging and billing and payment information, your account status, your billing type. They even want to know your credit history, so have you been suspended? The identification and verification data, so when you sign up for prepaid mobile plans, sometimes they ask for passport numbers, Medicare numbers, credit card information, etc. And then we get into a whole other list of technical communications data that forms part of the proposed data set. And that includes things like available bandwidth, upload and download volumes, the record of successful tariff communications and the time, date and duration of those communications, the records of unsuccessful communications, the time, date and where that communication is incomplete, any identifier which uniquely describes the service at the time of the successful or attempted communication included date and time, the source identifier for communications terminating on a provider's network or service, the destination identifier for the communication, the type of service, so whether it's cable or ADSL, the type of application, so it might be voice IP, voice IP, instant messaging, email, um, what other features you might have, whether that's call waiting, um, your upload, download allocations, and the location of the device. So it's an incredibly broad amount of communications data. And it's not in a form that me, as the regulatory manager, can hand over to our operational team and say, here's a technical specification, can you please retain that? For example, category two is described as follows. Information necessary to trace and identify the source of a communication. And it uses the language communication, um, which is incredibly broad. So I'll leave that there as opening up the discussion. Okay, thank you. And I think, um, I think based on the wording of this, um, you can see how Mr. Brandis was struggling to define it, I think. Um, and it clearly is, is not defined. Um, Chris, do you want to sort of step in and yeah, I, I talk about what you think this is all about? I think that's, that's an incredibly important point because if you watch that video and it's, and it's funny and he fumbles it and he doesn't quite understand what he's saying, but it's actually quite clear what he thinks he means. He thinks that you'll get URLs you, or maybe you'll just get um, uh, uh, top-level domain names or something like that. That's what he's thinking. Now, that was the policy announced on the Tuesday, I think it was. Um, Tony Abbott made some comments that backed up that policy as well. By Thursday, the policy was different. It was re-announced by Malcolm Turnbull and, um, and ASIO and the AFP. In English. In English, and they were talking about just source IP addresses. So, so far we've actually had two separate public policy um, uh, data retention announcements. Now, there's a couple of things we can point out about this. Um, first is that very clearly politicians, senior politicians, the Attorney General is going out and announcing policies that he is unable to articulate. That's a serious problem because that tells you two things. First of all, he's not bothering to learn about it, which is you know, a bit of a political issue. But more importantly, the policy has been entirely designed by the department, or it's been entirely designed by someone else. The second terrifying thing about this is that the National Security Committee of Cabinet and Cabinet itself signed off on a policy that it didn't understand. So what was the debate within the committee what was the debate within the cabinet room? Why do they think that they require this policy? Now, then of course you've got bureaucratic infighting where you see Malcolm Turnbull overriding, or well, the communications department effectively overriding the attorney general's department. All of this has a complex political economy backdrop. National security 
as we all know, is an incredibly opaque area of public policy. Most areas of public policy we can assess as voters and citizens and, um, uh, and, and political commentators in, 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 in some cases um, uh, based on publicly available evidence about problems and possible solutions. You can look at how things worked internationally and so on and so forth. In the national security sphere, you can't do that. Not only can't you identify the problem because the expert, there, are, there is one cadre of experts who are unable to tell you exactly what the problem is. It's also based on risk. So we don't know what the absolute risk is of say a terror attack or say of serious crime or, or something like that. So they're working partly in the dark. They don't know what risks are. We're working completely in the dark and the politicians who are supposed to be translating that darkness into lightness so that they can communicate and tell us what we need to understand as informed citizens are failing to do so. This is why we keep getting more and more national security legislation overall. The national security bill that was published, uh, that was um, passed by uh, parliament a couple of weeks ago, that was something in the order of 167 pages long. The um, foreign fighters bill, which is currently being debated is in the order of 220 pages long. You speak to national security legislation experts and they are flummoxed. They don't understand exactly how everything ties into itself because this is legislation written for the benefit of bureaucracies that we don't understand and we don't know how it's being used. The data retention debate has been going on for quite a long time, since 2006, but we're hearing it now because of this deep, complex national security debate that is, um, uh, 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 to be honest, has swept the world in the last six to 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. That was, um, <coughs> that was really insightful. A tour de force, I like to think. Yeah, no, no, thank you. That was great. That was great. Um, David, I'd like to bring you in here. I mean, Chris mentioned that this debate's been going on since 2006. Yes. Um, conscious of not trying to cover too much ground that we've already covered earlier today, um, also trying to disentangle the last two or three days of my life when I've talked about little, little else and what happened here and what didn't. But do you want to talk about sort of what's happened in Europe with um, the implementation of their scheme and then, you know, how that ended up um, working out for them? Uh, look, I, th I think let's go back to the fundamental principle. We can get into the details of the particular sort of data as well, which um, is worrying. Uh, but the fundamental principle uh, which the European Court of Justice was concerned with. It's really about what, what is good policy making in this space. Good policy making is working out what the problem is and then developing a solution to that particular problem. Uh, the problem with data retention laws as a whole is basically a very simple issue and a very simple problem. It's disproportionate to the nature of the problem concerned. It's untargeted it's too broad and it's unnecessary. Um, and that's what the European Court of Justice held in relation to the 2006 uh, data retention directive. Now in relation to that, that directive, the background to that directive. So let's, let's be clear. Too much of the time, bad policy is made because of a lack of understanding of history. Too much of the time, bad policy and bad laws are made on the basis of a very ad hoc reaction to particular circumstances. The data retention directive in part was a reaction to the London and Madrid bombings. Uh, as Mark Kenny said in this morning's age, uh, when there is a crisis uh, scenario, when you're in a state of uh, security panic or security emergency, that in itself is the very worst time mm. in order uh, to be trying to enact data uh, uh, security laws. Uh, in order to enact good security laws, as I said before, you need to be careful about targeting those laws to the particular nature of the problem. Now what the European Court of Justice held was that the data retention directive was insufficiently targeted because it targeted all manner of communications, it targeted Every, every person in the European Union, um, it didn't have any procedural safeguards about access 
to the information. So two things, the retention of data and then the conditions under which there is access to that data. And once the data is collected, there were insufficient safeguards in relation to the protection of that data. Uh, in all of these respects, uh, the European Directive breached Article 7 and Article 8 of uh, the European Charter, uh, the right to privacy and the right to data privacy. Uh, the problem with any laws relating to blanket data retention is that they are too broad, that they create, they're based upon suspicion of the whole population. Uh, therefore, once the problem is identified, there is a need for a regime which addresses the particular problem and that must be on the basis that there, if there is a need for collection of data, there must be a reasonable suspicion in relation to the particular persons whose data will be collected. And that's why blanket data retention laws always will be in breach of fundamental human rights. One of the um, advantages that the government has given us in discussing data retention in this specific political context is that they've actually been really clear about what they consider to be the problem. So this isn't just the same data retention debate that we've been having since 2006. We're having a data retention debate, according to the government, because of foreign fighters, people traveling to Syria and Iraq, fighting for ISIS or, or some other sectarian um, group, then coming back here and, um, uh, and possibly badness. committing terrorist attacks here. That's an incredibly specific problem. Hmm. And it's got incredibly specific policy implications that have been worked out in great and excruciating detail by a number of organizations, but none other than the, um, the, the former independent security legislation monitor who's proposed some very specific changes to um, passport controls, some foreign evidence stuff, that sort of thing, which are all important and, and I think uh, are completely justified and, and, and some of the government's, the government's bill now does a couple of those things and does it okay and, and so you know, we can't have too much of a problem with that. But what, by presenting this as a way to tackle the foreign fighter threat, mm. we can actually require the government to present evidence to say, well, you say you need data retention for the foreign fighter threat, why do foreign fighters specifically require mass data retention? Yeah. You know um, who they are. Well, you know, they self-identify. Mm. This is one of the best things about foreign fighters, yeah. they self-identify for you. So they are, A, at least, very high quality candidates for warranted surveillance. Which and, is clearly happening right now on these people. And, and B, it's already against the law so you can arrest them and prosecute them. Yep. Um, that it's illegal to go overseas and fight for ISIS and it, and it has been for a very long time. Um, so the advantage is that they've created the problem for which public policy should solve, but they are trying to squeeze into that quite narrow and restrictive problem basically the wish list of every law enforcement agency and government department. And tying on from that, that the problem is clearly quite disproportionate, the answer being mandatory data retention. And one of the ways that the government is aiming to get this legislation through quickly is not change the existing regime. It's really just slotting in mandatory data retention into the existing Telecommunications Interception and Access Act. And what that means on a practical level that's quite different from the problem that Chris just articulated is that the RSPCA can get access to that huge range of list of information um, to prosecute a dog bite or your local council in relation to your car that you might have got impounded and you didn't pay your fine for. There is no, um, in, in the access regime for communications data, there's no threshold in relation to the gravity of crime or whether it's um, a civil offence or whether it's a criminal offence. There's also... So it could literally be for a parking fine. Literally. Um, pecuniary, any, any agency that has responsibility for law enforcement. And there's no list of agencies um, in terms of a defined list. There's, there are literally hundreds that have accessed communications data in the past and obviously will in the future if this continues. What about, what about non-governmental agencies accessing this data? Um, you mean like the RSPCA? No, no, I or mean like commercial entities. Is that a reality? They're not law enforcement agencies. Yes. The way commercial 
entities could access this information is if they know that INET or Telstra or Optus or NBN Co or NextGen or any other communication provider, because these laws won't just apply to carriers and ISPs, they'll apply to, you know, Nick's web hosting company, um, et cetera, is, <laughs> is it will mean that there's a big amount of data that is known to be retained. So if someone has a civil suit against someone else, they will be able to seek discovery, arguably, from one of those communication providers if they think they might have information that will help them make that case. And the concrete example is copyright. Um, so a rights holder could say to an ISP, um, I've got 5,000 IP addresses that we monitored that participated in a swarm that were downloading the Golden Girls. <laughs> really? For example. <laughs> For example. <laughs> As a random example. It's not a random example, I actually. Know, I know that. That. You know that. I understand that. <laughs> um, sorry, the, the Golden Girls is, um, yeah, anyway. It's a whole other story for another day. Perhaps for the party if, later. If, if I, so, if, yes, if you I can could address. just um, reinforce some of the points there. Um, into the, in the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act, uh, there's a distinction, which is the distinction that's commonly drawn in arguments for data retention legislation between content and data or metadata. It is a false mm, distinction word. from the point of view of policy, from the point of view of protection of privacy, because data about data, IP addresses, etc., may reveal much and may in fact reveal more about your life uh, than content data. Uh, and, and, and because of this distinction... As, in, as Ed Snowden in, said, metadata yeah, doesn't lie. That's, that's right, yes, yes. Um, uh, there's no subjective element there. Um, uh, and because of this distinction is in the legislation, uh, and in the legislation there are very few safeguards in relation to metadata. In the last year for which there are reports, there were 300, over 300,000 uh, instances of authorizations under Chapter 4 of the Act. And uh, entities that were given access included entities such as Harness Racing New South Wales, Western Australian Fisheries, numbers of local councils. Uh, and so if a data retention law is grafted onto the existing Act, the data is there and there are insufficient safeguards in relation to access to that data. Yeah. The, the biggest supporters of data retention are not ASIO and the AFP. The biggest supporters of data retention and introducing a data retention scheme are ASIC. The ATO really wants a data retention scheme. Uh, the ACCC really wants a data retention because scheme. Petrol. Because, well, the ACCC particularly wants it because they want to um, uh, uh, catch um, fuel price collusion. And they think they'll be able to uh, see that um, one petrol station, one petrol company has emailed another petrol company and they go, oh, yeah, collusion, fantastic. But the point is that the politics right now about data retention is about national security. So the government is rolling out ASIO and it's rolling out the AFP and we're talking about foreign fighters. But the policy has very little to do with national security. The main users of, the, of any, any new regime or any addition to the existing regime will be regulatory agencies, will be these even lower agencies like the councils who have access already under the um, TIA Act, the RSPCA and so on and so forth. But I think one of the really important things to do in this debate is make sure that we're not arguing about national security particularly because that's not what it's about. That's not why the Attorney General's Department is obsessed with it and has been obsessed with it for, for you know, nearly a decade now. It's because all the regulators want access to this new honeypot of information. Everybody is trying to protect the public revenue. We have more laws, more regulations than ever, more agencies that are collecting sums, uh, collecting money from the public. They want new powers to protect and to expand their capacity to ensure compliance and control and so on and so forth. It's not a national security debate and we should not treat it as one, even though that's the way the political system would like 